you know, I always say that the, the, the best time to uh, prepare your company for exit is when you start. The second best time is now. Right. Like, just, it's what happens. Yeah, right. that, so yeah that's, that's great, yeah. Welcome to Tip Top, Grow Up Your Business with Metronomics. Join me, Shannon Burns Susco, and Metronomics Certified Coach, Jed Roberts. We'll be talking to business thought leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs, and business team coaches who have all taken the journey to grow up their businesses to their tip top. We'll be sharing strategies, systems, stories, and how you can grow your company up at the speed you want. If you're searching for your path to the tip top and feel your time is running out, then this podcast is for you. So today I'm with Bruce Eckfeld. Bruce is a fellow metronomics coach. Bruce and I met at a conference in Atlanta in Georgia in 2016. 2016 certainly feels like a long time ago. How are you, Bruce? I'm good, Jed. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's been, it's been a very long time since uh, since we first met. Today we're talking about what a CEO needs to be thinking about when they want to want to exit their business, you know, whether they're selling the business or whether they're passing on to the next generations. Uh, so as coaches, we often come across the situation where the CEO is wondering what's next, you know, where do I go from here? Uh, and this is a this is a very challenging time. It's a very emotionally challenging time. Uh, so so Bruce today what I wanted to explore is really What's, what are the pitfalls? What are the things that a CEO needs to be thinking about uh, when they come, when they decide or when they want to exit their business? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting topic. Um, and, uh, you know, I got into this, you know, through my own exit and then having worked through, uh, with several clients on their exits and just realizing how important, uh, kind of understanding what the different exit sort of opportunities or possibilities are inside of a company and uh, how they're going to impact how you approach the growing and scaling process. Um, and so it's, it's been an interesting uh, kind of exploration for me in terms of thinking through the kind of the strategies and then how it affects the uh, kind of implementation plans in terms of how we're going to grow the business. Okay. So, so the exits that you've been through, what sort of exits have you done? Have they normally been sort of, you know, sales, you know, where post-transaction CEO walks away, you know, earn out type of uh, exits? What, what have you seen? Um, I, I'd, I'd like to think at this point, I've sort of seen the range, <laughs> you know, everything from, I, I guess, you know, I have one client that, uh, they did a series D they did, I think they raised 45 million. They're probably going to go public in a year or two. So, you know, at the top end, there's kind of going public on things. Um, I've been involved in other ends where we're basically, uh, sort of liquidating the company and trying to figure out how to gain as much value with the remaining assets as possible. Um, you know, in one case, actually turning it over for zero dollars and turn and, and taking um, uh, a, rep, a portion of uh, future revenues. Um, I got involved in there late, and it was kind of a, uh, a, a how do I say um, conflict situation between partners. And we decided the best way to resolve it was actually to have them move on. So, uh, so I've, I've really seen the, ma- the the range. I like to kind of organize it in three basic buckets when I'm working with founders and kind of thinking through strategy. Um, I'll call it the distressed situation where there's some uh, oftentimes external issues, uh, either life life events or uh, things inside the business that aren't working. And we decide that, that some kind of an exit or liquidation is going to be the best possible resolution to things, uh, either allowing people to move forward, uh, you know, on a fresh start or, um, you know, that they really don't want to continue the business. And we're looking for, um, you know, trying to monetize it as much as possible. So I call those distressed and, um, you know, I like to kind of categorize them in multiples of valuations and stuff. Usually we're looking at somewhere between a zero and five uh, multiple of rev, uh, rev, multiples of earnings, you know, it, as being like what the market will bear for some kind of distressed asset, right? So there's some kind of hair in the deal that they've got to take on in terms of debt or situation, you know, and it's really going to hurt the valuation. This middle section, uh, which I call a financial exit, um, which is really kind of like a private equity or someone coming in with basically money and looking to um, take either over control of the company or make a significant investment. And it's a it's a more or less a financial um, calculation. They're looking at earnings, they're looking at potential, looking at growth, and they're coming up with a number saying, okay, well, I'm, I'm willing to pay X for Y percentage of the company. The most interesting one for me, uh, the third category, which I call strategics, uh, where we're really looking at how can we create some really unique value using the assets and capabilities of the company and the value and the, uh, the assets and capabilities that acquire and create some kind of synergies that you know aren't aren't there without the two of them together. So it's the one plus one equals three model. 
And there is where we're seeing, you know, if the financial exits are typically between like a five and 10 X, uh, that's where we see the 10 plus X kind of exits where, you know, the, the value is really some unique calculation or a uh, move that they're going to make in the market where they can have significant value above and beyond just looking at extrapolation in the finances. So anytime I'm looking at exits or I'm working with founders or we're looking at strategies for these things, I'm kind of first kind of figuring out where are they in these buckets and and where they want to be and how much time do we have and what can we do in terms of getting them ideally up the chain on those processes. In that last one, you're looking for the Rembrandts in the attic, as it were. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So Rembrandt said, like, I, I have a, I have a, uh, I call it Rembrandt's in the attic plus story that I tell um, because I find uh, if, if people aren't familiar with that, the idea is, is that you know every company has these assets and and they may not realize it and it really takes the market to kind of come in and figure out oh well you know you've got this capability or you've got this asset or you've got this IP you know we can we can make that really valuable. The 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 plus version of that which I like to tell is so for the company side there are asset and capabilities. Well, depending on the company that's going to acquire, the, the value of those assets and capabilities might be quite different. So the Rembrandt story is that, well, there's a Rembrandt hidden in the attic. Someone finds it. They say, oh, and the market value is $20 million. So I'm going to pay a lot more for the house that holds the Rembrandt than just the value of the house. My version of the story is if I'm a collector and that Rembrandt happens to be the third in a series of Rembrandts and I have the other two, like my value of that Rembrandt is going to be even better than just anyone happens to know the Rembrandt is there. So I may be willing to pay $50 million for that because completing the collection that I have creates a, a significant more value than any one of those pieces individually. And when so we're working with companies on coming up with exit strategies and where can we possibly find value uh, in the market, what we're really looking for are companies that ha- that are missing pieces and if we can be the missing piece to those companies, that's where we can create these really exceptional uh, opportunities for valuation. E- even if the rest of the market knows that that piece is valuable because they don't have the other pieces already, they don't complete the puzzle. So th- that's the really fun part of doing the exit strategies and finding these opportunities is seeing where can we complete puzzles and we can re- really create significant value. So CEO comes to you and says, okay, I want to sell my business. What should they be thinking of at that point? And what should they have been thinking of a year ago, two years ago? Yeah. So I always like to say that this process is a little bit of a a dialectical thinking uh, challenge because, you know, on one hand, uh, I I say you should always, you should be running the company and operating the company like you're going to keep it forever, right? Like you never want to, you don't want to be in a position to have to sell. Like you always want to be able to continue operating the company. On the flip side, is you always want to be ready to sell if you want to. So when a CEO comes to me, I'm basically assessing the how ready are they to sell and, and what is really driving the sales desire. And I got to work with them to figure out, you know, how, how do we make this something that gives us options and opportunity that's not painting us into a corner. So ideally, they're coming at least two to three years before they, they have a, a window or an exit uh, goal. Uh, and we start looking at really what are going to drive what's what's going to drive valuation inside the company. So we do kind of go back to the fundamentals, looking at uh, everything from kind of financials and record keeping. Um, you know, do we have uh, data rooms with all the documents and all the contracts and everything? Um, I was hit a uh, uh, a story. I was talking to a CEO the other day, uh, and they had an exit where they were missing a key uh, vendor contract. Uh, and, and they ended up having to pay almost a million dollars to get that contract signed so they could do the deal. It was an $80 million deal, so it was worth it. But I can't tell you that the the documents that can't be found when you know the time comes to due diligence. So you know, making sure that we've got all those pieces in place so that we're actually prepared to sell uh, and then start looking at what can we do to really um, enhance value drivers and remove value detractors. Um, so that's kind of first step. And then we can start looking at strategies of, okay, now that we've got things kind of in order, where are some of the opportunities and what might we need to do in terms of strategy and kind of tooling the company to be you know, a, a good fit for those potential acquisition opportunities? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've seen CEOs come to me and say, look, uh, no, I, want, I want to sell the business. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm 62 and I want to be out of the business by the end of the year. It's like, well, when, have you, when did you start preparing? Oh, I haven't started yet. You know, and that, that's a really difficult conversation because- if they've never done it before, they don't know how difficult and fraught the process is, and they don't know how long it takes. 
Uh, and there's a bit of an education piece there, isn't there? Because they they come in this with this sort of, you know, a little bit naively thinking, well, okay, all I've got to do is go and speak to someone and then we'll fi fix a price and then I'm out of here and I'm drinking pina coladas on the beach. But is it ever like that? It's never been like that in any of the ones I've been through. Have you seen a really smooth exit? Um, I, I guess relatively I've seen smooth exits, but even the smooth exits are, you know, come with hair. So, uh, you know, I, and I'll be honest, I mean, uh, I think the the majority of exit uh, exit attempts don't happen, uh, and you know every, every uh, successful uh, exit that I've uh, you know talked to or been part of, you know, it's had multiple failed exits prior to that. You know, and sometimes they just they need to go through that a few times just to kind of like oh get, get beat up a little bit and realize what they need to do. Sometimes it's just you know it's just not a great fit or or something happens you know last minute. I mean I've I've seen deals end you know twenty four hours before you're supposed to sign, and so. You know, again, you have to operate the company. You have to you have to run things like you're going to continue to own the company because if you're too focused on that, um, it, it can be uh, catastrophic and, and sometimes even an existential crisis. You know, in terms of getting through some of those things. Um, the other thing I like to just kind of tell CEOs, uh, particularly CEOs that haven't done it before, right? This this is a once. This this is the first time you're doing it in your life. Like this, you may only do this once. Maybe you do it a handful of times. Right. If you're selling to private equity, right, this is a Tuesday for them, right? Like they do this on a regular basis. And so not not only are is just the comfort level or the familiarity with the process vastly different, but the the experience and the strategy and you know what they're willing to do. I mean, they they'll, you know, they can move on to the next deal, right? So just no, just realizing the asymmetry between, you know, buyers and sellers and knowing that you're going in there um, with that with that difference is important right and you know it's one of the reasons we say you know build a good deal team right and, and one of the things I've really focused on is I call it deal team coaching is actually helping the banker the accountant the lawyer sometimes the wealth manager like all these people is just keeping everyone kind of in line and focused on this and dealing with some of the risk profiles and making sure that we've got plan B and plan C for if this deal falls through. Because otherwise, then 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 we have to sell. And you never want to be in a decision to have to sell, right? That That's going to put you in a very bad strategic you know, negotiating position. Yeah. You, you mentioned a, a deal team there. And then, you know, that's something that, that surprised me many times that where the CEO has, has no understanding that he needs help. Uh, and, uh, you know, he actually needs professionals to come in and help him. And, and if he hasn't got that deal team in place, then they're, they're probably not going to get the maximum value out of their business and they're probably going to get taken for a ride. What, what's the ideal, te ideal deal team look like to you? So it's, it's somewhat depends on the nature of the sale. You know, if we're doing a distressed sale, you know, that's going to look really different, right? Because we want people who can move pretty quickly, who have access to, uh, you know, people that are willing to buy, um, you know, that kind of asset. Uh, if we're doing uh, more of a financial deal, you know, we want people who are looking at mostly the private equity world, right? People with money who are looking to treat this more as an investment. If we're looking at strategic, that could look quite different because it kind of depends on where we see the opportunities, the strategic opportunities. We, we may want to put together a very different kind of deal team to be able to access different kinds of markets or different potential buyers. So I always start with, let's get the, let's get the company in shape. Let's make sure that we're kind of sale ready. And then start thinking about what a strategy might be. And then we can start putting together the deal team. The, the other challenge I'd say around the deal team is I realize that like everyone's got some angle in this process. And if you're dealing, you know, the type of investment banker you're bringing in, you know, if, if they're, you know, if, if they're selling, if they're, if they're helping put to market lots of, say, um, uh, media companies, Right, and they're basically selling those media companies to the same four or five uh, acquirers, right? Like as much as their compensation is coming from the seller, right? There's a lot of incentive. They've got a relationship with the buyer, and they've sold several companies to this buyer. They're, it's going to be hard for them if they sold four companies to a buyer at eight times, you know, revenue or eight times uh, earnings. And you're you're hoping to get twelve times earnings. It's going to be really hard for them to sell you at twelve times earnings when they just sold several other companies at eight times earnings. So understanding that each player in this process, you know, has a little bit of an angle to how mm -hmm. they look at the deal, their ability to get the deal done, their time frame, right? How hard they'll push certain things. 
Like it's it's really important to understand everyone's gonna and you need to put you need to put together a team that's gonna fit with the exit that you want to have. Yeah, yeah, and the the buyer is never ever ever your friend. Yeah, well, I mean, correct. I mean, it's just the nature of the process, mm-hmm. right? Like you, you know, they're they're you know fairly opposing parties. I mean, I would say that ultimately, and and this is kind of the challenge is these things is you're you're you know you're going at it in the negotiation process, right? You're 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 clawing for every single dollar and then you get bought and now you're supposed to work together. So a lot of this is how do I set this up in a way so that I can have a, an effective but yet you know ethical and uh, you know viable negotiation so that if I end up doing the deal and particularly if I'm going to have kind of earn out or if I'm staying on if I'm going to be the CEO or I'm going to be part of the ongoing leadership team and I'm going to keep equity in the company I'm going to play forward like you, you need to kind of figure out not only get the deal done, but I need to make it a deal I actually like being in post deal. I mean, if you're doing all trans, all cash transaction, you're just walking away, and then yep. you can you can handle it a little differently. But unfortunately, that's not the case for a lot of deals, right? You have to think about that. What what's the future relationship going to look like? Yeah, and normally they want the CEO and probably part of the leadership team to hang around for a while, particularly when there's IP and there's relationships that need to be maintained. So. You know, they're going to want to. They're going to want to keep part of the team at least for you know one year, two years, or however long they, they want the earnout to be. Yeah, it, it really depends. I mean, I've seen things mm. that um, uh, on the financial stuff. Usually, there's some something like that. I mean, it, if it's a pure financial where they're not doing roll ups and stuff, yes, they need that. I mean, they're, they're, the 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 acquirers are the, the financial acquirers are not going to be operators, right? So they need to keep the operator team in place. If they're in some kind of roll up. Uh, I've seen, uh, yes, there's usually some kind of ongoing role they want uh, the founder and leadership team to play, at least for some period of time, because they're usually acquiring it for some strategic reason. They need to keep the capabilities going. Um, and, and you know, for a, a strategic deal, I've seen it go either way. Like I've seen some cases where they uh, they do want leadership to stay on for some period of time. I've seen other deals that were just like, you know what, we're buying you for your client base or for some IP, you know, yeah. like wash my hands, go away. They, so I've been in one or two deals. They didn't even know what they were, why they were buying them, right? And it wasn't until after the deal was done where it was clear like, oh, I see why you bought <laughs> Because it was so nuanced and so like, uh, uh, you know, kind of strategic in terms of what they were trying to do. So nice. it, it really kind of depends. Um, I, I think more importantly, it's understanding as a founder, as the owner or founder, what do you want? And if if that's not clear, mm-hmm. or you haven't really done a little bit of the soul searching, and, and obviously, I mean, this is half of what I end up doing in these cases yeah. is more therapy, you know, is understanding like, what do you want out of this deal? And how do we make sure that we're going to have the parameters around this? Or and, and sometimes it's trade-offs. It's like, yeah, I want an all cash deal, you know, at this valuation. And it's like, all right, well, we can't get that, but we can get mm-hmm. this valuation if you stay on for a year you know, is it worth it? Like we literally start having trade-off values. What's a year of your life worth, right? And it depends on what they're going to do. If they're not going to sit on a beach anyway, they're like, yeah, I'll put another year. If they're like, no, I, I, my next venture is already set up and I've mm-hmm. got to move on to this thing. That might be worth three times what I'm actually getting paid for this thing. Yep. So getting clear with the founder on what their parameters are and why, so that we can figure out what terms we're willing to kind of consider or where we're going to have trade-offs is part of it. And it's that fit, right? At the end of the day, it's got to be a fit between buyer and seller. And non-negotiables often become negotiables once the reality of the <laughs> transaction process goes, sinks in, doesn't it? Yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, every non-negotiable, it just depends on, well, what's the rate card we're going to use, right? Yeah. Like it's, there's always a price. You know, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, some, and sometimes you get surprised, right? Sometimes they're like, wow, okay, they're actually willing to pay it. And sometimes you're like, why aren't they paying this? And then it, it mm-hmm. You just don't know. Like it's an asymmetrical informational situation. So, yep. and, and that's just the reality of it. Yep. So, so if we go back right back to the beginning of the the process, uh, and um, we you know we look at you know motivation. Uh, you know why why does the CEO or why does the you know the the owner want to leave? You know why do they want to exit? You know, I've I've seen everything from um, I want to retire. I want to get out of here. I I hate the industry. Um, I can't do this anymore. To um, I'm really, really interested in this new idea I've got, and I just want to move on. Now that's, I mean, that's there's there's so many different reasons for so many different motivations for why a CEO might want to want to exit. Have you seen any particularly interesting ones that just you haven't seen before that are surprising? Um, I, I don't know if I get the ones that I can't mention on air. <laughs> um, 
I, it's a, it, 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 this is an important one, and I and I kind of bucket this in two types of uh, motivations or two types of forces, uh, pushes and pulls. So pushes are those things that are um, kind of forcing me out, right? So whether it's like, you know, I just can't do this anymore. I'm like, I, I'm tired or I'm, yeah, I'm retiring or I have some kind of external life event. I've got, uh, you know, partner disputes, right? Like all these things that kind of force or push us into a sale. Um, then I, then I have character or I have a bucket of things, which are pulls, which are like, I'm, I'm ready to move on. I have another idea I want to execute. I have a business opportunity. I'm ready for the next stage of life, right? Like I've, I've got something that's pulling me to the next thing. I, I like to create pull. I find that deals that are driven by push um, are, are forced, right? That's where we're in situations where we kind of have to sell or we have to, you know, take terms we don't really want because we're like, we just have to do it. Um, the pull ones are much better because uh, it's about, I, I'm, I'm doing something else. I'm, I'm moving on to something bigger and better. And I'm not going to sit there and get caught up in, you know, a half a percent on something or, you know, some term which, you know, is an issue. It's like, I don't care at that point. I just, I want to move on. I want to get the best deal possible. Um, so I, one of the first things I do is kind of diagnose the the founder or founders in terms of what's really driving things. And as much as we can shift this to a pull rather than a push situation, it's going to give us a lot more kind of not only options, but just energy, like positive energy in the process. Yep. And I've been in a pull situation, but unfortunately the CEO hadn't really done his preparation. So he desperately wanted to move on to something else, but his business wasn't say already. Uh, so we had this conflict where he was losing interest in the business. He wanted to do something else. And because of that, he wasn't really focusing on his business. So the value of his business was pretty much going down month by month. And you know, the, that's that realization of like, okay, what, what do you want to do? Is this a fail sale? Do you want to just get rid of it so you can focus on a new big thing? Or do you want to spend the next 18 months to two years getting that ready for a sale at a really good premium, which means that you've then got the capital you need to do the next thing? And he's still struggling with that. He hasn't really got that. He hasn't really come to a to a conclusion there. But he needs to pretty quick. Yeah, no, it's hard. And and you know sometimes you know figuring out how to quickly put a bow on it and and sell it is not necessarily a, the the worst thing. It's just it, are they ready to really kind of swallow that pill and move on to the next uh, next piece? Um, I've, I've been in one or two situations where the the lack of making the decision becomes the bad decision that <laughs> they end up having to, it would have been better if a year ago, we just would have, you know, found a good buyer. Things were better. The, the business was doing a little bit uh, better at that point. All right. It's that, um, th that apathy that starts to accrue that really kind of hurts not only the value of the business, but really the potential sale, the energy around it, right? Like a, a lot of this stuff ends up being, you know, just what, what energy you're bringing to the whole process and who you're attracting and it can be problematic. Yeah, and, you, and you're putting all your, all your focus on maximizing the price. And in the meantime, you're running the business into the ground, which makes the gap harder and harder to close. There are certain strategies, certain things you can do to kind of peak the business a little bit. As I always say, it's like, okay, it's like the Olympics. It's like, okay, yeah, an athlete's going to train for four years. And, you know, you start adjusting your schedules and you start, you know, you taper things off and you increase your, you know, carb intakes, like whatever. Like you, you, you can kind of like peak for this week of the Olympics. We can do some of that. But the fact is, is that, we don't know if that's going to be the sale. And if we peak too hard and then that one doesn't work out and it's going to take another six months to get the next opportunity. Like if you've kind of burned through things and you're now in a trough, that's why I say it's like the, the best kind of process that I've seen or that I kind of recommend is just keep operating the business like you're going to own it forever and just be ready to sell at any point. And when that opportunity comes up and the deal looks good and you're ready to pull it, then pull the trigger and sell, right? But you, you don't have to. That, that's where most of the, the bad situations happen is when they're forced into a sale. I was working with a client quite recently and they, they got an offer. Uh, they weren't happy with the offer, so they continued negotiating. And in the meantime, they lost a big contract. All of a sudden, the multiple went down. Now, six months later, they were talking about a very, very different number and not in a good way. Mm. Yeah. 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 It's unfortunate. And, and it's, it's just the reality of business too, right? Businesses go up and down and, and, and sometimes it's, yeah, you know, there's risks here that we'd love to get off the table and we'd love to sell. In other cases, it's like, 
you know, let's push through it, right? Like, let's get through it and get to a better side and we'll be in a better position to sell at that point. So that's why I say it kind of goes back to this, like, what are the motivating factors? What are the external factors? Um, and, and what are our windows that we need to hit and how do we, you know, maximize things and, and try maximize the value, but also maximize the window. So we have some options. So how do you mit mitigate risk in an exit? Um, well, to make a, a make sure that I've got a business that can continue to operate. Um, I, I think the other thing is, you know, really understanding what the nature of the deal is that you want, and and what are the kind of the underlying calculations, right? Because I think a lot of times people get fixated in a number, and the more things are rigid going into these negotiations and going into the deals, like the the, the more chances you're going to start breaking things, like deals can fall down because I'm I'm really rigid around things. So I say that's the first thing is have have some flexibility and some trade-offs in this. So you have some room to negotiate. Um, I think the other thing is like, I, you know, I, we do a lot of pre-due diligence, right? So it's like, you know, if running through due diligence early and catching all the things that are going to come up, um, I talk about skeletons. I think I've, I've written a couple articles on this is like, I have this conversation fairly quickly with the CEO. It's like, hey, let, what are the skeletons? Like, if we do a diligence, what what's what's going to come up? Let's get it on the table now and start to deal with it, um, because it's going to come up, right? And and you know, we can hide it, or you can you know not tell me about it, not tell anyone about it until some auditor goes in there and starts poking around and realizes this isn't the case. That that's not not only is it, it's likely going to kill the deal. Even if we get a deal done, it's going to hurt your valuation far more than if we deal with it first, or even if we just disclose it up front, like just like, hey, look, we're selling the company, but here it is. Here, here's the here's the ugly little thing that's going on here. It, you're much more likely to get the maximal valuation there. And then if it comes up, you know, a week before you're supposed to sign, right? Like even if you get to the table to sign something, that's going to be ugly. So I think the more that you can just be open and honest and get those things on the table and start dealing with them sooner, that's going to reduce your risk and, and in, reduce risk in general of getting the deal done, but also valuation. And, and that's that's going to impact trust levels within the within the within the process. And like that, you want Rembrandts, you don't want skeletons. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. So you talked earlier on about about being a you know a counselor or being a, you know a a coach to the CEO and the team through the exit process because it, the, it's often a much more emotional process than th people think it is. Now there's. CEOs have built their baby. You know, they built their company. They they identify as being part of the company. Uh, and I, at a, at a, in a previous podcast with Carl Saunders, you know, you know Carl very well as well. You know, we talked about you know the what happens on day zero plus one. You now, what happens when they've walked away? You know, have they have they prepared themselves for the next phase in their life? Uh, and often that's not thought about at all often that's sort of just not a consideration and, and it can it can have a very negative impact because they've lost their identity they've lost their identity that made them made them who they they were and i've seen ceos uh, fall down pretty badly because they're just not ready for the next stage they're just not ready yeah yeah I, so i'm i'm we're putting it together a podcast we've been recording it will launch soon called from angel to exit which is kind of talking about all these stories and <laughs> Uh, I, I obviously won't name anyone, but I had a call with someone who had a very, very nice exit. Um, nine, nine figures, right? Like it was, what it was like, and this was maybe a year ago. Yeah. And I was like, so what's the biggest challenge? He goes, biggest challenge right now is I got to figure out how to stop drinking at 10 a.m. You know, and it's just, and it, it's not, it's not even like, you know, smart guy, right? And, you know, lots of ideas and things like that, but just didn't have a plan and going from like, literally consuming everything in his life. And and it was one of these, like, uh, here are the keys, give me the cash and I'm walking away. Like he had, didn't have to be. And the, it, and he knew it, right? Like he, like people were telling him, he was like, yeah, I know this is gonna be a problem, but still just failed to really appreciate how significant that was. And uh, it's kind of going back to my other comment is like this whole idea of push versus pull. One of the reasons I want to have pull is I want to make sure that they're going on to something that they're excited about, passionate about, so they don't end up in this, you know, kind of chasm of what do I do now? Um, and it is, you know, it's, you're going to have a, a major shift, right? You know, into your life, regardless. Like, even if you have a, an amazing plan and you're ready to go into the next thing, like, it is going to be significant. But without a plan, it, it can be, you know, catastrophic at times. So, um, and, and it can look differently, right? And this is a lot of the kind of the therapy process, which is, you know, what do you want to do next? And how does this exit 
serve as a springboard to that. And, and for some people, it's, yeah, I've got the next business lined up. I've got a bunch of ideas. Other people, I want to you know be an angel investor or I want to go early stage stuff. Other people, I was like, I want to join a private equity firm. Or I want to create a family office. Some people, I was like, I want to do a foundation. I want to do anything. I've got a whole nother, I've got a, uh, a nonprofit that I want to start up. Other, it's like, I just want to go travel with my family. Okay, but then let's put together a plan. Like, you know, they're like, these are entrepreneurs that, that are used to plans and strategies and goals and achievement, right? Like it doesn't have to be a business, but you have to have some, something that's going to drive your purpose and your decisions and your day-to-day -day life. And without that, yeah, you can get, you can get in some trouble. Yeah. You, you can't go from 120 miles an hour to zero just like that without it having massive impacts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pina coladas on the beach are all very well, but not at 10 o'clock. Yeah. I, you'll do that for like two days, all right? Like every everyone I talked to, yeah. I mean, I like uh, that was my situation too. I was like, I like, I was not going to be sitting on a beach and drinking pina coladas. I needed I needed something to do. You need a break, right? I do recommend having a very uh, uh, a, a, a defined, intentional, strategic period of transition um, and reflection. All right, like this is an amazing opportunity to kind of really take stock. And look back on what you've learned, what to apply going forward. There's a lot of the podcast that that uh, we're putting together is is these stories of reflection and learning and like what do you do next and and particularly people that have done this a couple of times and just realizing like they learn something every time. I mean, just because you've exited a couple of nice businesses, like doesn't mean like oh yeah, piece of cake, right? In fact, the interesting one that comes up is now that they've done it a couple of times and now they really know how this process works, like it becomes actually harder because they're not. They, they're not as naive, right? They don't have this blissful ignorance of what this whole thing takes. So that's been actually the interesting kind of realization with some of these folks is, is figuring out, okay, how do I get back into the game when I, when I know how hard the game is? Bruce, what's the fastest transaction you've seen? Yeah, it was kind of a crazy situation with a partner and uh, we ended up at a put call uh, and I basically pre-sold the company in 30 days. The contortions that we <laughs> did to, to make that work were probably slept a total of 40 hours over that month. <laughs> um, but you can do it, right? And the point is, like, it, motivated motivated buyer, motivated seller, and you get the stuff together. It doesn't have to take months. You know, it usually takes months because we're running the business. There is, um, you know, we're trying to collect data. They're looking at options, right? We're trying to create uh, an auction scenario. So, I mean, I would say, you know, when we're advising clients, you know, six months, Right. Like when, once you kind of go towards, uh, hey, look, I'm looking for some opportunities, like six months is probably about the soonest I would see. Um, you know, again, depending on the nature of the deal, if we're going to go uh, kind of private equity, it's a pretty straightforward financial transaction, six months, nine months. Um, you know, if you're doing a strategic, you may spend a year or two, right? Like when you're really looking for that, that right fit and that the company that really sees the potential value, again, it's like, keep running the company, right? Like, and be ready to sell at any moment. I, I've, I've seen, um, you know, I've, I've seen sort of deals accelerate very quickly uh, where we've been talking, 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 and then I'll say, oh, okay, look, we want to close and it, it happens very quickly. So again, you just, you got to be ready and, you know, you got to have your ducks in order. It's, it's not a competition, but my fastest was six weeks. Uh, and, and, and this was a, one of my clients that was uh, basically selling to a tier one consultancy. Uh, and it was, they were a machine. You know, they arrived with an entire bid team, you know, and they just had the process and like, and a, okay, first we do this, then we do this, week three, we do this, week four, we do this, week five, we do this, week six, we close. And it's, and I was thinking, yeah, that's a great plan, but it's not going to work out like that. But it executed exactly to plan. And, and the, the reason why that transaction was so small, smooth was you know, partly because they do it all the time. Uh, but secondly, because, you know, we'd been building out this plan, not necessarily for exit, but we're building out this 36 month rolling plan. Uh, and we could put this in front of the buyer. You know, we could put all of our strategic plans in, you know, in front of the buyer and say, okay, you know, I've been working with them for two years at this point. You know, two years ago, we said we were going to do this. You know, this is the strategy we built out. These were the numbers, the targets we set ourselves. These are the things we said we would do. And we could show them the progress. We could show them the increasing revenue. We could show them the increase in profit percentage, you know, over that period and that extrapolation out to the two and the three years. So they ended up getting an industry uh, leading multiple, uh, not on their current revenue, but on their forecasted three-year revenue because they believed the plan. You know, the 
uh, they believed that because we've been doing it for two years and we could predict it, that we could continue to do that for the next two, three years. So, so that was that was a but that was such a smooth transaction, uh, and it was it was a machine. Yeah, and it goes to show. I think the um, uh, the thing to realize is that you know your your valuation is what someone's willing to pay for you, right? And you know you can have all the kind of calculations and comps and you know things that you want, but at the end of the day, it's got to be what the buyer perceives as the value. And you have to realize, I mean, the buyer's expecting some kind of return, right? If they're going to be buying you for a certain amount of money, they've got to figure out how they're going to make that money back. And the more that you can show them that that will happen, right? That, hey, look, we've been doing this year over year, quarter by quarter, and and this is the growth, and we're projecting these things, and we've been hitting this. Here are the projections we have for three years, and we can demonstrate a, a track record of being able to hit these projections. A buyer's going to be like, okay, I, I trust you, right? Like, I, I, I see your ability to execute. I'm more likely to be able to give you the valuation. If not, like, you know, a buyer coming in to a leadership team who just shows them some three-year plan that they made up the week before, I mean, they're smart, right? I mean, it, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're going to look at that and be like, okay, you, I don't know what words to use. You pulled that out of something this last last week, right? Yeah. You know, hmm. I, I've got to discount it. Like I've got to factor yeah. in a certain amount of risk that I, that might not be true. Uh, and if you can show them that it is, it's, it's going to help you. Yep. Yeah. The ink's still wet. I don't believe it. I don't trust it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Or the first time you did it, is this the first plan you've ever created? Then Okay. <laughs> and then it's a case of, you know, how do, how do you sort of reset those mismatched expectations? You know, the, the CEO wants this, the buyer's prepared to pay that. You know, at some point you've either got to close that expectation gap or you've got to walk away. And um, yeah, that puts a lot of power on both sides, depending on their motivation. You know, yeah, the term you use, you know, the push and the pull. You know, if the if the CEO is being pushed to sell because he has to, then uh, they they lose their bargaining position, they lose their ability to influence the value in the, of the transaction. Well, and the other the other thing that happens is, um, you know, it gets pushed into earnout, right? So they're like, okay, you you say you're going to make this over the next couple of years, we'll give you a third or a half now and the rest is performance based right and you gotta you gotta prove it um which uh you know if if the team really can do it okay fine but you know if now now you're you're kind of uh you know building your own coffin in some respects right if you've if you've overestimated or you've been too aggressive on those projections and now you've based your earnout on those um you know the fact is you might not get it Right there, there's a there's you're now at risk on that. Right, it's a pretty classic situation for uh, w when when they don't really trust the numbers. And I, I've seen that go badly. You know, they they do the sale, they they agree an earn out. You know, the 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 post trans you know the post transaction mood is often very different to the pre transaction mood. They suddenly realize the culture is completely different. They suddenly realize they don't like their new owners. You know, the motivation to hit those targets just disappears, and they never get there. And the question then is, do you walk away? You know, is it really worth two years of your life? Is it really worth working in that toxic environment for two years just to get the earn out? Sometimes it is, sometimes sometimes it isn't. But the other thing to realize is that, I mean, you're selling your company, right? Like in, in the vast majority of cases, you're giving up ownership control. So you're, you're basically tying your earn out to someone else's whim. <laughs> and so like you need to realize that. Um, one of the things I generally say is, Whatever deal we strike, um, you know, owners should be should be willing to walk away at any point with whatever they had at the at the signing table, and not care that much, right? They're going to care a little bit, but they need to be comfortable with that because they're going into a situation they don't control, right? You're going into a situation where you control everything. To I just I don't control things. So you if if you need the money, that's where you get in the bind, right? That's where you know now I need the money, but I don't have the power and control, so now I'm stuck. And uh, yeah, I've seen people serve jail sentences uh, in their own companies. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And uh, the, the 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 expectations of the CEO not necessarily being reset after the tran transaction. You know, what, what do you mean I can't buy a new boat? Well, it's it's not your money anymore. You know, what do you mean I can't go away for two months? You know, mm -hmm. or or get you know uh, you know have my assistant or you know, uh, do this office party or, you know, these things that it's not even like egregious, like spending things like they may be really good business decisions. They might be like, hey, we need to invest in this IP because in order to hit this market and owners are like, no, we don't want to spend the money. And and, you know, it, it can be it, it can be really severe for some of those folks in terms of the, the lack of control once they're on the other side. 
So if we were to sum up the exit process as a, you know, a series of, you know, be, be careful of statements, you know, what, what would they be? I always start with the kind of inner game, right? Like is really getting clear on the why and what do you want to get out of this and what's motivating and are those things that are going to help or hinder you in the whole process. Um, and once we kind of figure that out, then we start looking at the company, right? And we kind of go through a series of tiers of, okay, we need to clean these things up, these things we need to improve. Then there's things, it's like, it kind of depends on which strategy we're going to go. If we're going to go financial, if we're going to strategic, we may focus and invest in different areas. Um, but understanding that, like getting the cleanup done, then you start to look at strategy, right? And then we can start to tune the company. And, and then we're putting ourselves in the buying process. And depending on the potential outcomes, you're going to do that differently. Um, and figuring out the deal team, figure out how you're going to manage your, your leadership team, right? A lot of this is, how do I not get distracted, right? Like, how do I keep my eye on the ball in terms of continuing to grow and scale the company while being ready to sell at any point. So one of the things that always interests me is when you're starting a company, you, most CEOs have the have the expectation at some point they're going to exit. They don't know when, they don't know why, they don't know how, uh, but they, they, they probably want to exit at some point. So Bruce, what are the things that they can think about? Or what are the things they can do right at the beginning to make sure that their business always stays exit ready? Yeah, so some of this depends on the nature of the company and what kind of potential exit you're going to have. Um, you know, it's very different setting up a services company versus a SaaS company versus a product company. Um, but, you know, keeping in mind that I'm, I'm going to have an exit, I always tell people, you're going to exit the company in one way or another. It might be feet first, but, you know, th things will end. Um, and you need to kind of understand that and keep that in mind. Um, a couple of things that I've certainly uh, I've seen problematic that they haven't done. Um, you know, so getting together data rooms, right? Like really from day one, you know, making sure that you've got uh, good repositories and good uh, processes for keeping track of all your contracts, you know, customer contracts, supplier contracts, employee contracts. I had a couple of cases of a couple employee contracts that I couldn't find late at night, right? Like, so making sure that you're really um, rigorous uh, with uh, all the documentation around the company, because that stuff, you know, unfortunately, it's hard to find later. It's like, you know, you're searching through emails, things like that. So creating a good data room, data repository for that stuff. Um, otherwise, making sure that you have all of your um, uh, legal compliance uh, issues, you know, you set up the entity right, you know, you've registered it, you're keeping it up to date, um, all the taxation stuff, right? This is where, uh, you know, taxation things start coming into play, you know, due diligence will bring up all those things. So just being good stewards of the corporate entity is really important. Uh, Making sure that you've got, um, the, the more you can make sure you've got good, solid customer contracts in place. Um, you know, anytime you're going to do a handover, you get all the things are like, yeah, we've been working together for 10 years. Like they're my best friend. We had a handshake deal, like things like that, like just don't pass muster when it comes to transactions uh, or at least are going to hurt your valuation uh, quite a bit. Um, I would say, you know, the one is leadership, right? Like having a good, solid leadership team, uh, you know, that's going to really offset this risk of, you know, owner, founder exiting the company. Like, is there anyone that's going to be able to kind of take your place or step into leadership roles? Like any buyer wants to know that I've got some redundancy. Um, there's lots of things we look at in terms of how client concentrations and stuff like that. Um, having a clear strategy, right? Like making sure that you really understand how we're making money, how we're, you know, what is the strategy for growth and uh, 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 scaling the business. Um so those are the things we're typically looking at or things that you can do kind of early in the process. Um, you know, the flip side is, you know, you got to you got to get going. Right. So, you know, it, it, sometimes this is we got to get some traction. We got to get some revenues in. Like, I get that. Um, but as soon as you can start investing in some of those things, get it done, because it's really easy to be like, hey, look, we're, we're running. We're making money. We can get a new client. We can scale this thing. We can open a new office. Right. And you start outstripping the uh, corporate governance side of things. Um, and. You know, I always say that the, the, the best time to uh, prepare your company for exit is when you start. The second best time is now. Because <laughs> right? it's like, what happens. Yeah, right? that, so yeah, that's, that's great, yeah. Because yeah. when you're starting a business, those are the last things on your mind. It's like, no, we're running 120 miles an hour and we're going to keep running and like, you know, contracts, yeah, well, whatever. We'll deal with that later. We'll deal with that later. And you never, ever come back unless you do it right at the beginning. Until it's now. Then you've got to go and scrabbling for those employee contracts and customer contracts, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. At some point, there is an optimal time to sell. Now going you know, right the way from the beginning to, you know, to the end, you know, what are the trigger points for you that you see 
sort of coming up, flashing up to CEOs that indicate that now might, now might be a good time to sell. Earlier on, you mentioned around, you know, maximizing value, peaking value. Now, what are those trigger points? Did you, can you see those trigger points? What I like to think about is uh, creating windows in the future, right? So, I mean, if, if a CEO comes to me and like, oh, I'm ready to sell now, I'm like, okay, like th- th- we, we have mo- l- limited options or we have l- fewer options than we otherwise would have. What I like to do is find these kind of early indicators, like, oh, I've got a life event coming up. I've I've been in this business five years and I'm kind of, you know, really kind of thinking about, do I want to be in it in another five years or not, right? I could certainly be in another two or three. That's easy. 10 may feel a little funny, right? Like, so I want to catch these kind of early indicators of the, the things that might suggest that we want to create some sale opportunities in the future. Um, and I usually start with the with the founder or the founders, right? Is figuring out where are they, what, what's their future vision? If they can't give me a really clear, compelling vision of where the company is going to be five to 10 years in the future, that's a flag, right? That that tells me there may be a lack of real desire, motivation, vision for where we're going. Um, the, the company itself, you know, it, it, it's going to be somewhat dependent on the company and the market, right? Like oftentimes we're dealing with, hey, where are you in this market? You know, we're, we're at a kind of frothy period, but it's going to consolidate in a couple of years, right? And like, we don't want to get stuck without a seat, you know, in the musical chairs. Like, we may want to be ready to sell once we start seeing some of this consolidation happening. Um, so sometimes it's externally focused. Um, but, you know, it's really, again, it's like, be prepared to sell at any point, right? Continue to operate the company, but being prepared to sell at any point. And then we're just looking for those triggers, looking for those triggering events like, oh, hey, did you see that the uh, so-and-so just bought these two other companies, right? Like, is this the beginning, right? We see some private equity plays that are doing some roll-ups. Like, okay, may- maybe we need to kind of get into the game here and and get a get a seat before, you know, things start running out. So it's, it's, it's tough to tell, but there's things we can do to at least figure out what those windows might be. Bruce, we, we met at a conference in Atlanta in 2016. And, you know, one of the things that really impressed me was, that, you know, you'd, you'd clearly gone through many businesses, you know, you had a wealth of experience. Maybe take us back a little bit, and what what was the journey that got you through to to then and to to now? You know, it's a it's a fascinating journey. Yeah, yeah, I was a little uh, circuitous in terms of how I got into the business world. Um, yeah, so I started as an architect. Uh, I did two degrees of architecture at McGill University in Montreal, and um, uh, grew up in Minnesota. I was back in Minnesota for a little bit, and uh, got recruited to New York to work with interactive media. They they at, it was early internet days or kind of even pre internet days CD ROM development. We were doing three D modeling animation, so I got into consulting and I kind of got into this um, agency world. That then internet took off and we started working with um, some pretty big brands on their digital strategies and building out um, uh, various kind of e businesses and doing kind of digital transformations. Um, and I got into extreme programming. Uh, I ended up working with a guy named um, uh, Ivar Jakobsen, uh, was the founder of the Roop process. Uh, so I got very into software methodology, discovered agile, um, extreme programming originally. So I uh, was fascinated that as a, from a product point of view. Uh, so we founded a company doing uh, lean agile software development and product development, uh, working mostly with mid-market companies. And, and so I honestly, it was like we had a project. I had to put an LLC together to do it. The next time we got another project, it was like, oh my gosh, we have a business. <laughs> so it grew, it scaled. We put it, we opened a Boston office. We put it on the 500 list a couple of times. And then, Sorry, yeah, Bruce, I've got to interrupt yep. you there. You, you worked with yep. Jakobsen. I worked with Ivar Jakobsen, yes. Gang of three. Yeah, he was one of the three amigos. Wow. Yeah, wow. That, that, yeah. it was way back. It was interesting. He came to New York a couple of times. Um, uh, a brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, technologist. Um, he didn't understand the web at all. It was, it was really, it was interesting to, to kind, of, um, kind of figure out how to transform the kind of object ordinary programming world into kind of this internet uh, web kind of world. Um, and it just, it taught me a lot about not only, you know, software development and complexity, but organizational change, right? And how, uh, I mean, a lot of what we did in our tech company was uh, train software development teams, um, 50 to 200 people on lean agile processes. So test development, continuous integration, right? And so a lot of what, I mean, I kind of joke, I started with, you know, bricks and mortar and windows to bits and bytes and technology to now people and teams, right? It's like, how do we solve these puzzles and how do we figure out the growth process and how do we figure out structures and elegant solutions? And so a lot of my tech experience was really on the organizational side and process side. 
Um, and I, I gave a little bit of the story of selling that. I mean, I was not a programmer. If something, if I was writing code on a project, something had gone horribly, horribly wrong, right? Like I shouldn't be writing production code. Um, but I knew enough about, uh, you know, the whole kind of product development side and strategy side and the business side. So I, I was interested in moving on um, from that very kind of tech business um, and that did a couple of interim executive roles, CEO roles with uh, an assessment company and uh, learning company, and then got into coaching, right? It was just a natural, I'd done a lot of lean agile coaching, so there was a lateral fit for me. Um, but I started working with some companies on strategy and building out leadership capacity and uh, I was scaling up in my company. Uh, and then, so I was using some of that and then joined 3HAG. Uh, I do some stuff with Predictive Index. I have some other kind of affiliations with the Flow Research Collective. Basically tools and frameworks that really are about strategy and executive performance, leadership performance. Um, yeah, and I've built my practice around, uh, around you know, working with companies in various spaces, a lot of stuff in real estate and tech, uh, just because of my background's there. I got into cannabis uh, many years ago. Um, I run a big podcast on that space called Thinking Outside the Bud. Uh, got me into psychedelics. I do some work in that space with a venture capital firm. Um, and then kind of a smattering of other, uh, other industries, but all gross stage companies. And you're a very experienced podcaster, you know, far more experienced than I am. So, so tell us about your other podcasts. You know, you've just mentioned one of them. Yep. Yeah. So I started a couple, I have one, uh, thinking outside the bud, uh, all about the cannabis industry and, and, uh, cannabis business. Um, I have one called scaling up services. Uh, just, I came out of services and consulting. So we cover, um, how to scale service companies of, of various sort of sorts. I like to say service companies are easy to start. They're hard to scale. Uh, so I covered that one. Uh, the psychedelic one is called Psychedelic Invest, uh, and we cover the psychedelic space mostly from an industry or from an uh, investor, uh, CEO, some regulatory kind of uh, guests as well. And then the new one we're recording and we're going to be launching in a couple of, uh, about a month or two here, is called From Angel to Exit. It's really focused on the growth and exiting stories, um, just because I find that is it's such a fascinating uh, area. And we've had some amazing guests already uh, to, that are they're telling stories about growing their companies and exiting. Some some quite successful, some not. So, so th so this episode is quite a fortuitous time in advance of that new podcast. It is. Mm -hmm. it is. I'm excited. I'm really excited about the new podcast. There's there's yeah. some great content, and great stories. Yeah, I will be sure to listen to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bruce, that was awesome. Thanks very much. This was this is absolutely an episode that I'm going to listen back to. You know we. We don't like our own voices, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll struggle through that to listen to this episode again, that's for sure. Thanks so much for your time today, Bruce. That was awesome. Thanks, Jed. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on today. Tip Top is brought to you by Metronomics. To find out more about Metronomics and how this proven 20-year-old system will save you time and money as you grow up your business, visit metronomics.com. That is M-E-T-R-O-N-O-M-I-C-S. Dot com. Share your thoughts on today's episode in the comments and suggest topics you'd love us to explore the next time. Also search for Metronomics in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere else that great podcasts are found.